So well done. If you, who's got their ID books here? Just let me see. Yay. You got open to write your notes. Um, Michelle, have you been checking Mike's notes? Are they, are they okay? <clears throat> so we've been working, if you've recently joined us, we've been working through a purpose series, um, taking the Sunday message and working it through during the week. And lots of you are connecting in groups. The youth, other guys are connecting. And so it's been really good. Amen. I hope you've been reading your devotions. It's a way of just getting us going and getting us all on the same path. Uh, we started off by saying that purpose uh, doesn't start with escaping this world, but it's in this very world that God has put us for a purpose. A purpose is also not just finding our own thing to do, making up your purpose as you go, whatever you want it to be. But we said that purpose actually starts with the one who created us. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works. And so purpose starts when we understand that there is a creator who made us. And he made us for a purpose. And that's what we've been talking about. And then we said there are, there are five general lanes that if we, if we understand it like this big freeway, if we run in those lanes, God makes it more clear what our individual purpose is. But God has a purpose for all his people. And last week, like I said, as, as um, Craig Sweet talked to us, he... Um, He's a sugar specialist, so what can we say? I don't know. Um, our first purpose is that we were created for Christ, to know Christ. And I mean, that, if, that is something amazing. Now, if your view of Christ is small, if you think like, oh yeah, well, and already I think you have a problem because Christ is incredible. Christ is phenomenal. Christ is it's just when we don't have a revelation of Him, we think like, oh, well, yes, to know Christ um, is a small thing. And I want to say, press into Him first and foremost with your life. So much of the counseling challenges, so much of marital challenges, so much of whatever problems we have, if you just press into Jesus, that's the number one answer for the most complex problem you might have. Because if you're pressing into Him, I tell you what, it will change your life. And so uh, I love that. That is our main purpose. So the first lane we run in is our purpose is Christ. But today we're talking about our purpose is to become Christ-like uh, or Christ-likeness. And um, our verse from Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, it says, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And so this is what we, we would call sanctification. But not only are we called to know Christ, but Christ is supposed to change the way we are, the way we speak, the way we live. There's a form, there's an image, there's a mold that God wants to shape us into. And like Jesus was the firstborn, um, so he wants us to become more like Jesus. And so we're going to ask three questions today. First one is, why do we need to change? If our purpose is Christ-likeness, why, if, I, if I've met Christ and I believe in Jesus and, and I have salvation, why should I change? Second question is, what does it mean to be more like Jesus? Can we be a little bit more specific? Is there something about Jesus that we can go after? That we can say, okay, that's what we're working towards. And then the third question is, how then do we become more like Jesus? Is that okay? That's where we're heading. Let's tackle the first question, and, and that is, why do we need to change? Why is it that we should change? And Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read two verses there. Uh, verse 14 and 15. It says, do everything without grumbling. Amen. Or arguing. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. What a powerful verse. And what this tells me, first of all, and you might say, like, what a warped, crooked 
generation. Many people think like, no, life is actually quite normal. But you know, if you live in subnormal for long enough, subnormal becomes normal. And actually what's normal seems like extraordinary and above normal. The scriptures tell us that the world that we live in is crooked and depraved. And so if you think about it, we, we have this tendency to take all the things that God gives us and twist it and warp it and, and make it crooked. We take, for example, gifts that God gives us like food and drink and turn them into, you know, with our gluttony, we could turn it into something that we worship. We take God's gift of sex and we can twist it into something that's completely perverted. We can take God's gift of leadership and turn it into a dictatorship. That self-serving with us in the center. We can take God's gift of the natural world and with our greed and lust for money and power turn it into something that, that's not what God intended it to be. Theologians call it this total depravity of mankind. There is no one who seeks God. Not even one, as Leo led us in the prayer meeting with that encouraging scripture. What that means is, try as we like, we cannot quit sin. Martin Luther once described it like sin, this, this inherited sin that we have is like his beard. Every morning he shaves it off and it's nice and smooth and tomorrow you get up and there it is again. Amen, Lil? Or is that happening yet? Not yet. Just checking. And so what we are saying is that if we're all fallen and a crooked, and it doesn't take much to look around at the world and see what we are capable of. And taking all the good things that God gives us and make them crooked somehow and put man at the center and turn it into something that is not what God intended. It's then that we understand, well, it's in that crooked and depraved generation that the, the reason why we should change and become like Christ is because God wants us to be like sons and daughters that hold out this word of life in this crooked generation. God wants us to shine like stars in the sky as we hold firmly to the word of life. Of life. What good is it for us to tell them about Jesus, that they were created for Christ, when, when they look at our lives, there's nothing of Christ-likeness coming from us? Does that make sense? You see, when I received Jesus, the one who was crucified, resurrected, glorified, and exalted, when he washed away my sin, he started to straighten me out a little bit. Take out that bent, warped, crooked part in me that previously always bent towards sin. And he wants to begin to straighten it out and change my life to become a light to the world that I live in. You know that that doesn't mean suddenly you become perfect. It's this process of God now taking sin out of me as He's already removed my sin from me at the cross. He begins to change me and my nature. And that's what we call sanctification. And I want to say there's reward for that. There's purpose for that so that we can reflect Christ to the world. Come on now. <clears throat> <laughs> what did you say? Can't I? Oh, sorry. Okay. Can someone else please do it then? Thank you. There we go. That's better. I also want to be one of those. <laughs> if, if I say, come on now, are you going to preach? Uh, what does it mean to be more like Jesus? And you know, for the sake of our series, we're trying to just be intentional about, about putting these lanes into place. But... I think what does it mean to be like Jesus means many, many different things. Our speaking, our attitudes. Uh, you, can, you can definitely, in Philippians it speaks about you should have the same attitude as that of Jesus. Um, but we're going to look at two things. What does it mean to look more like Jesus? And go to Philippians chapter 
to to find some of these uh, these things. But what does it me really mean to become more like Jesus? Uh, I'm going to read from verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind that Christ had, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What a powerful scripture. There's two things for me that stick out here. And, and one of them is to become more like Christ actually means that I become more humble. Christ humbled himself, even though he was equal to God. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. This is the Son of God. Now, I know in, in the world's culture this is not celebrated. This, is, this, this would seem like weakness, but I want to say that God honors humility. And we'll see that with Christ's life, that God exalted him to the highest place because he humbled himself. Someone once told me, don't ask God to humble you. You might not get up. <laughs> humble yourself. And He will exalt you. God opposes the proud. And being proud and arrogant does not reflect Jesus in any way whatsoever. What Jesus showed us here is His humility and His sacrificial love for us. First of all, His humility. Isn't that amazing that he, was come, he, he came down and was willing to mix with people that maybe didn't meet His standards? Me and you. He came to a world... You know, that was full of sin. And he, he left perfection to come and to be with us. And so humility for me means that he's not selfish, self-absorbed, um, power-hungry, dominating God who's using us for his advantage. But actually he, he laid down his own agenda to help us and to serve us. Are you willing to relate to people who are much lower than you? In status we're always self-promoting I remember Bob Mumford saying this um, those six little giants of self-centeredness and that is to look good in front of people to feel good to be right to stay in control your own personal advantage and, and your own hidden agenda, if that's the way we operate, it's so opposite to Christ. Christ humbled himself. And for us to be more like Christ-like, more, you know what I'm saying, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> to be more like Christ means that we reflect more of his humility. What about his sacrificial love? This verse tells us that the, the, the pinnacle of his expression of love was actually to die on our behalf on the cross. Courageously he gave his life. You know that even those who stood there and mocked him and spat in his face, that he died for them also. Died for them also. And so I feel like God wants us to have the same courage as Him to love other people who are not like us, who might not love us back, but that we'd be able to sacrificially love them as we become like Jesus. This is the mark of those who follow Jesus, love for each other. 
See in verse 9 where I said that the world often sees us as weakness. If you're humble and you, you show sacrificial love, they basically say, aha, this is an opportunity to walk right over you. But this is how God sees it. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. His humility and his sacrificial love was the precursor to God exalting him to the highest place. Cool. So how does this happen? <laughs> I suppose that's the big question. How do I become more like Jesus? In verse 12, it says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to work in order to fulfill His good purposes. Isn't that, um, that verse amazing? Because in one hand it says, you must work out your salvation. And the other hand it says, it's God who's at work in you. And so honestly, if I asked you, when last has something in your life changed? When has something in your character changed to become more like Jesus? Let's just take his humility and his sacrificial love. And then how does that happen? Well, I think it's this partnership between us working with God while God is working in us. Some people think that, you know what, just, just it's 100% God. And it is. Because without God doing it, it's not permanent. And without God doing it, you know what it is. It's like we're just in our own flesh trying to be better people. And you know that's never going to produce anything. But at the same time, it says, work out your salvation. And so God is at work, but I need to allow God to do that work in my life. And so God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross. He invites me into a relationship with Him. He gives me His Word, and He gives me other people. And He gives me His Holy Spirit, and He's done all of that. But then I have to work with Him to change me. I need to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, which means I need to have a very high view of God as I, as I look at my own life and say, I need to change. Yeah? It's the Holy Spirit's power in us that helps us. And someone once said, this is, you know, there, there are three ways to cross the ocean. The first way is in a little rowboat, where you get in this boat and you just... It's all your own effort. You have to change. You have to change. And you're rowing across this ocean. You know, some people like that will probably say, God helps those who help themselves. So help yourself and just like, you know, God, that's how God helps you. Help yourself. So be a better person. Be more humble. Be more self-sacrificial uh, in your love to others. But I've tried that. Do you know when I was a young man... Um, when I first met Jesus, I, I, I tried to change the way I speak. And I would say to my friends, listen, but every time I swear, can you just give me a lay me? You know what I mean? Well, that didn't last long. So when they punched me, I said something I shouldn't. I said, I'll punch you back. Why are you punching me? And they said, you said I must. I said, never mind. But without the help of the Holy Spirit can't change so other people say well okay well then it's like uh, uh, crossing the ocean on a raft you're just going to park off and God's going to do it and some people I've even heard people say to me pastor it's your job to make sure that I stay on the right road can you just say a prayer for me and just lay your hands and by, by this magic wand like a raft you're just going to float across the ocean and land up in a place where you look more like Jesus drifters Their favorite motto is, let go and let God. <laughs> Not God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> it's let go and let God. 
And you'll just float and, and if you if you look again, you you'll be just like Jesus. But I think the right picture is that of a sailboat, isn't it? Any forward movement is totally just because of the wind of the Holy Spirit. And yet somehow I have to move the sails and steer and, and work with the wind to be able to progress and to move forward. I'm not just floating around and God somehow magically going to change me. I'm going to wake up one day and just be more like Jesus. And it's also not this effort of rowing every day and saying, Lord, I'm, I've got to be, I've got to be, I've got to be. But it's somehow picking up the wind of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the people of God around me and saying, Lord, I can see see the direction you want me to go in now holy spirit blow and i'm steering in that direction and i'm keeping my sails tight to catch that wind and i think if we do that we work with the holy spirit train ourselves we become more like jesus um, in this process of sanctification so what does that mean practically then practically I think in our choices that we make in our choices that we make to say Holy Spirit give me the power to steer in the right direction since God lives inside of me by his Holy Spirit you know it's 24 7 he's with me and I can say Lord Will you blow in me to make the right choice, to have the right response, to have the right character? Often it's like uh, when they cross the Red Sea, you take that first step and it happens. Making the right choice, obeying the word, obedience somehow unlocks that power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it? When you just say, Lord, I understand this is your will. I understand this is what you want for me. I understand, Lord, you're wanting me to be uh, more humble and, and sacrificial in my love. And so I feel you, you're prompting me to make this decision to act in this way. I want to say, just step into it. Obey it. And it's amazing when you do how the power of the Holy Spirit begins to blow into those sails. And you feel somehow, yes, I'm working, but He's working also in me. And then, I think practically putting ourselves in the right context. So it's our choices and putting ourselves in the right context. How do I change to become more like Jesus? Well, let go and let God. You might end up where you didn't plan to. Well, well, God helps those who help themselves. Well, I tell you, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. Some of those changes will not be permanent unless God's done it in your life. And under pressure, guess what will come back out? The crooked old me. But when I make a decision, Lord, I want to become more like Jesus. I want my attitude and my heart. And so, Lord, I'm going to make the choices to obey you and take a step in that right direction. That's how we work with them. But secondly... Putting ourselves in, a, in the right context for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. What does that mean? Number one, being in His Word daily. See, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to breathe life into it and to speak into my life. And I want to say this, if you're not spending time reading the Scriptures for yourself it's very hard to expect the Holy Spirit to somehow do work in your life. Yeah, you've got to make those choices in the moment, but you also got to immerse yourself in the right context. Amen. Our purpose is Christ-likeness. Why? So that we can shine in a world that, that has no clue what Jesus looks like. They will use the name Jesus, but no idea what that means. So why should we change so we can reflect Him to the world around us? Being in the context of His Word. And here's one that maybe is not 
one that we always like, but being in trials, allowing trials and tribulations to bring us closer to God. I've found that when I'm cruising and everything is going well and I don't need, there's not much motivation to change. But in trials, I often have this, this choice to make. Do I lean into God? And often when I do, those times are amazing times that God's doing things in me and changing me to become more like Jesus. And I want to encourage you. The harder it is, the more humility it requires. The tougher it gets, the more we have to depend on Him and we have to admit Without Him, we can't do this. It's not a bad thing. I think sometimes we want to get out of those trials prematurely. Someone once said, you know, it's like clay. If you don't allow it to finish its process, there's something in its consistency that, that you have to start over again. You took it out the oven too quickly. You have to go and start with a new batch of clay. And sometimes we have to finish that process. I was saying to someone the other day, often trials is like you're walking on this road and this, this trial comes your way and you kind of see this open door on the right-hand side and you think, like, there's a way. I can just get out of this and avoid this. And you open that door and you take that road. And as you go, ha, 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 you go around again and you, find, and you come and, you and you st when you look again in your life, you find like that thing is there again. And I know what you're going to do. You're looking for the door on the other side. But somehow it's through those difficult times that we just embrace them. We just embrace them. And we say, Lord, in this trial, I'm, I'm looking for you. And when you lean into him, you find that the Holy Spirit is producing more and more of Jesus in you. Jesus didn't shun away from the toughest thing that God the Father had called him to do. But he embraced it with courage. Embraced it with courage. And the result is salvation for the world. You're doing all right? I won't say come on now because I I'm not allowed to say it. Thanks to Damien. You're controlling the screen. You should just put, come on, no, hang on. Hang on. You're going to be completely distracted. So, <laughs> putting yourself in the right context, friends, putting, your, putting ourselves in the Word of God, sometimes being in trials and leaning on God. I, I often said, say this, God custom builds the trials for us. You know, sometimes I just think, like, God, how, who thought this up? It's exactly the thing that brings out the little kink in me that I hope no one would ever see. And Lord, you, this trial, no one could understand this. But like somehow you know what this is producing in me. But you want me to go through it because you're bringing it out. Not that God causes pain and hurt. God, that's not God. But we live in a fallen world. And God will use difficult situations to form Christ in us. It's easier to be proud and say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm blessed and it can't be reversed. Amen. I'm thinking of more wilder sayings, but I, I haven't seen all the stickers on your car. So. The third part of putting yourself in the right context is being in community. Being in the Word of God. Being in some form of trial and being in community. Many people think that to become more like Jesus, what you just need is your Bible and more prayer. But I want to say that God, there are some issues that you will never change unless you put yourself in community. There are some areas that you will not become like Christ unless you put yourself in a community. And that's what relationships and friendships are all about. Iron sharpens iron. You can't sharpen iron with wood. Amen? Some of you are more iron than others. But we need each other. 
And our sharp edges help us to grow and become more like Christ. You two behind the controls. Who gave you controls? So let's just finish by putting this all together. Why do we need change? Honestly, friends, look around you. Look at the world we live in. It's been in subnormal so long that what they call normal is so far off from what God intended it to be. Man absolutely at the center, using everything and warping and twisting everything to serve man. And we can see the distortions everywhere. Why should we change? Because God wants us to shine like stars in a crooked and depraved world. God wants authentic sons and daughters that bear the very image and reflection of His Son, Jesus Christ, to the world. That's why our purpose is to be fashioned more like Him. Now, I don't know what it is that you're struggling with. And I'm talking here about especially, you know, humility. Don't confuse it with humility. Humility is like... <laughs> it's like you're so proud of being so humble. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm so... I don't know if I can give a good description... Humility is not being about proud about how gentle and how meek and how mild I am. I don't see a Jesus like that. Jesus was powerful. Jesus was strong. You did not mess around with Jesus. He was firm. He understood who he was. It's not that part of him that we're talking about. We're talking about the part that he, though he was equal with God, he, he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. For us to be able to not put ourselves in the position of always being the one that's advantaged. That's humility. Putting others' interests before ourselves. That's humility. Amen? What does it mean to be more like Jesus? Humility and sacrificial love. I don't know this thing of love. You know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts. We've got to get a grip on this thing because there is a ma the world wants us to hate. So anti-Christ. We hate because of language, history, differences, whatever. We find every reason to hate. I want to say it's anti-God. We hate sin, but we, never, we should never hate people because God loves them. How do we become more like Jesus? We work with Him. We want to be that sailboat. Works with the Holy Spirit. And we want to put ourselves in the right context. The Word of God. The trials. <laughs> Thank you. Let's stand. Thank you for landing us there, Elred. Please stand if you can. I don't want us to forget just what God's done this morning. Some of you are going to this week go and climb that mountain. This week. And I feel like God's going to give you wisdom. God's going to show you that path He's gone before you. Some of you I literally feel you're going to go and have your quiet time. It's not going to be so quiet. God's going to break in with His presence. You're going to not be able to be aware of anything else but His presence at times. It's going to be weighty. And from that, God's going to begin to release you into, into some things. And for some of you, I firmly believe You're going to walk out of darkness. You're going, to walk, you're going to walk away from those shadows, never to go back again. I 
believe God wants to do that. So, Lord, we thank you that we can be together. You know, Lord, we love you, Jesus. We sang about your name. It's the name above every other name. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you that you've knitted us together as a community, Lord. Thank you that you've placed us and put us together. May our friendships, Lord, grow. May, our, may we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, Lord. May we work with you, Holy Spirit. Those that have been striving, maybe, legalistically, just applying the law. Lord, the law has no power to change our hearts. But your amazing grace, your incredible grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness, Lord. And somehow when we grasp the grace that you displayed through your humility and your sacrificial love, it blows us away and it changes us to become more like Jesus. And I pray, Lord God, for your, your sanctification processes in our lives, Lord. Our attitudes, our thoughts, our thinking, our choices. Make them more like Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that's in us constantly, daily. You live in us. You speak to us. May we turn the sails of our hearts to pick up the wind of your Holy Spirit. May we direct the rudder and the choices of our lives into the purposes of God. As you begin to change us more like Jesus. And Lord, following Jesus is not just about a Sunday morning. It's about every single day, wherever you've put us in this crooked world. Let them see you straightening us out. And may it point them to Jesus, we pray. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please stay for coffee. Um, connect with one of the groups if you haven't. There are books here if you don't have a book. Let's keep going. What a pleasure. Please pray for us. We are going up to the city Friday, Saturday. We're back on Sunday. But National Elders Time is happening there. So one more little trip before we see you next week. Amen. God bless you. Remember to fetch your children. Okay. It's okay. didn't really fit it.
Adventure, welcome to the future.